Good evening, everyone. Uh, what a delightful evening we're going to have. And the reason we're starting a couple minutes late is we have a person from St. Louis, Missouri, and from Wis Wisconsin. Wisconsin with us tonight. And they came just to hear you, Dawn. So you're on stage. <laughs> they get the prize for driving the car. They do. <laughs> you get the extra cookies. Well, we want to welcome you because it's always exciting when we have new people come to our presentations that we do here. Uh, one of our goals is to try to educate about the history of our area, and this certainly is an appropriate uh, topic for us to enjoy this evening. So with no further ado, ado I'll turn it over to you, Don. Thank you. That's pretty well told me not to use it, but we'll see. If I need to use it, oh, uh, thank you. I always get a kick out of doing this, and this one, we may have to stretch this into two nights. <laughs> I, uh, I just thank you all for coming. Uh, when Debbie asked me, you know, we're going to do another one, I said, sure. And she said, what's it going to be about? Well, what about early farming around here and stuff? And she thought that'd be a good idea. But what's really cool is, you know, we put the word out that if you got photos, send them in. And we just got some fabulous photos. They aren't stuck with just looking at my family albums. And so it's pretty cool, I think. And we'll see how it goes. And if you got anything to contribute or correct me or to add to it, just haul her out. And so I started now with Grandpa. That was Grandpa Emil in 1921, and I just love that picture of the Lisa family. And I made a comment through this that we don't have many farming pictures in our family. And then Lisa took on the task of digging into her grandma's and her great grandma's boxes of pictures, and we got farming pictures out of the evening. So, but this is one of them that she found. And, I mean, Grandpa was such a handsome, young, strapping yes, man at that time, and before Grandma got him all handpicked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. is that the east, east side of the barn? I think that's probably Ben Teske's. That's before he was married. Okay. I think that's the barn at Ben's place. Okay. And uh, I, I, uh, I just think it's a wonderful picture of him. And, you know, they always said to all the Teske boys, they just had a heck of a baseball team, and they said that Grandpa was a heck of a pitcher. And, but when he married Grandma, Gottfried says it was time to quit playing games and work. <laughs> so, yeah. I could see him being a baseball pitcher in that picture. So, then Lisa found this one, and it ain't a very clear one, but one of the things I kind of want to highlight on it as I was looking at it is the horses have their fly nets on. So, you don't see that too often, but uh, fly nets are still sitting in there in the barn waiting on another horse. And I don't know what Grandpa's got in his mouth, but anyhow, behind it, the barn is still there. I mean, that's on the old farm. And, but that was the house before the other house was built in 1904 and kept her new family in there. The previous owners that was the house, so that house is probably, that building is probably a good 150 years old as the barn is, etc. So you'd think I'd take better care of them. So this whole thing got started. Lisa I found this picture a short time ago, and it's a little tiny picture. And I said, well, I scanned it in and started blowing it up and the clarity stayed real well until you get this big. And it was shocking to me because on it it said it was Grandpa and Dad and Marvin. And, but as soon as I blew it up a little bit, that's Dad on the tractor, absolutely. Him and his expression, that's Grandpa on the binder, and then that's Marvin holding the dog. It said they were binding notes, cut notes. And so, Anyhow, that's kind of what led me to tell Debbie that maybe we ought to do this on early farming. And so, let's see if this works. It's about three or four minutes if you put up with me. Can you hear it? Good afternoon. I'm 
Brent Benner, and we're here to talk about our McCormick Deering Grain Binder that we use to cut oats that will thrash at Emden Farm Heritage Days. First, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, early on, farmers cut their grain with a hand-cut wheat cradle, just like this. And I heard my granddad talk about he and his father cutting grain and having it thrashed in Inman by a man named Mr. Coley Reeves, whose descendants still live here. But basically a wheat cradle, you take it and you make a sweep here, you cut the grain, dump it out by hand, and then somebody come along behind you and tie it in a bundle and it'll be carried to a threshing machine somewhere else. Uh, this was what a lot of people in our area used to cut their grain in pre-depression days. But uh, even at that time, there were people that had reapers that would cut the grain with uh, a contraption pulled by horses. A guy named Obed Hussey probably built the first one about 1830. But Cyrus McCormick gets credit for most people for inventing the reaper, which basically did the automated cutting and just dropping it on the ground. Later, they had what they called a raking reaper. They would cut and then lay the grain out in a little pile. Somebody come on by hand, pick up and tie. What we have behind us here is a McCormick Dairy grain binder, which it, it combines the process of cutting and tying into bundles, which will later be carried to the same thing that done. This machine is about 100 years old, and we've used it for several years here. We originally bought it from Mr. Zane Bristol, who used it to, to cut grain for our show before we did it here ourselves. And here's a little bit about the machine I can show you right now. This is the cutter bar here. Cuts the grain as you pull along. You have these canvas sheets that have wood slats that are pulled by wood rollers. They carry the grain up into the part where it's tied. This reel just helps move the grain against the cutter bar, makes it cut good and clean. We can walk around, I can show you some more about this. The operator will sit up on this seat here. You have several controls. You can control the pitch of the, the cutter deck. You can also control the height of the reel all while you're sitting up here. And there's a pedal over here where the bundles come out on the carrier when you get three or four bundles together, you can pull the pedal and it'll drop the bundles in the same place where you can pick them up in a row in the field. Let's see if I can pull it up here. That'll drop it down, you pull up, the bundles fall off, you raise it back up and keep going. This is the twine can where the twine that's used to tie the, the bundles comes out of here, feeds down through here into the tying mechanism over, over here mechanism. It's very similar to a modern one, so very little bit changed on the knotters. This machine is driven by what we call a full wheel down here. You can see this big iron wheel with cleats on it. It turns all these sprockets and such that turn the, make the canvases move, makes the cutter bar, cutter bar work, and the knotter, the tides knot.
this was a coupon bunch. So, Fit the horse, and so that's the one he 
had on him all those years and it's still there in the barn. And I put, I'm going to other people real soon. And then we got like a hundred pictures Lisa found that's clear at the end. So whenever we get tired, we can quit. But these are kind of cool, I think. And so, anyhow, that barn on the old farm, you can see what it looks like today. But when a tornado came through in the early 30s and took a good part of the buildings off of that farm, all the neighbors came over and built that barn to help out. And so that was neighbors helping neighbors. That's pretty cool. And it's lasted this long. And so, and it looked really nice back then. Oh, I thought I took that out. So then, Here's Grandpa and Janet and Pearl and Doll. And there's the barn like it looks today. So the barn's still there. The horse equipment's still there, but the horses ain't Grandpa. Oh, I had to put this one in. I had to put this one in because all the excess profanity that I used too much in my life was learned that day. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that, Karen? Is that the 60? 720. 720. Yeah, we traded it in on the 4020. It was a mess. That's Ken sitting on the hood and me on the seat on that one. I know Joy's in there and Janet. So, now we get into the color vendors. So, Deanna and Patty sent me all these photos. So, that's a pretty good shot of the sawmill with the steam engine behind it. Uh, Frank, Ozzy always told me that his dad built that sawmill for him. And who am I to doubt it? Now, Ozzy, Ozzy said he helped him build it, but he was so small he had to stand on a bucket to do it to run the lathe and that they built all the pieces for it. And uh, so I just assumed that was Omega, and then I got to read a little more when I was getting this ready, and Ozzy didn't move here till 59. He lived at Irby. With, his dad was a blacksmith at Irby, so if his dad did build it for him, they went to Irby to get it built. So. And none of the pictures had the, you know, the tool wanging and the water wanging. I was hoping to get everything down in there. But so we got this. I've never seen the steam engine that I can remember running the song yet. So these are kind of special to me. If any of you helped them guys do that, you probably don't think it was that special. But, you know, I've helped enough when it cat engine. These are such high quality, I wonder if it is it his photos. I mean, they are superb quality. I don't know where you get them from, Deanna. They're in the museum collection. You must see them. Okay. I don't have any of the I'm going to say, before, before uh, all of them left here, we'll come to one. Most of these are dated in 1953 or 1955. And see, that's, that's color that was in here as the uh, box. Okay. We should have knowledge of that. Okay. That's knowledge I don't have, so mm -hmm. it's good. He owns all these places. Oh, yeah? Yep. So this is. This is kind of neat, what was on the back of the photo. Burton Baldwin standing by the K. Steen tractor, Lester Colderman Farm, or Duluth, but who owns it now and where it's at. And so that's kind of cool.
Yeah. And I posted on Facebook a video of a steam engine like this hooking up back to back with a hot rod John Deere pulling tractor. <laughs> the steam engine just pulled that pulling tractor all over the place. So I guess I should have put it on here. <laughs> I also noticed the uh, spark guard on top of the smokestack. It isn't on all the pictures, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Then that one, Carl Kohler was making sorghum molasses. I, when I put the call out, I was asking for, you know, the steam engine and the sawmill, but then also for the place where I live, where Karen Joe lives. They made sorghum molasses there a lot. There's a huge cane press there and the ruins of a building where they processed it and everything. And I was hoping to get photos of that and they never came together. And I was going to pursue it more, but then it got really long without it. So that's another night. But this is how they would have done it in there too, because the baskets were there in the shed and like that for, for moving it from the container. You know, as it thickened, they move it down the line and heat it. So these are some miscellaneous ones that I didn't quite know where to put. And so we had an event happen here recently up home. The Orville Vera Martin's home got sold and moved to the lease to be reliving it. Yeah, and that's pretty cool. But it, uh, what's being told to me is it was built. Well, Frank Martin got married in 1918 to this Gadal, so I don't imagine the father in law would have built him the house until they got married. So I'm guessing that's when the house was built. If there's anybody in that family here, you can correct me. But then she died the next year in 1919 in the pandemic that was going around the world. And she had an infant daughter, Iverna, and that's why my grandma raised her for part of her youth. And so, anyway, that's the story on that house. But then the rest of that story is that's the house that was there before that house. And this is the house that Guthrie Martin lived in. And, and many, before they moved into the house that we all know where they lived at. And that's, Grandma's a little tight there, right there. So when next door is Diana's grandma. Yeah. That's Yeah, and so that's Guthrie, many, and they originally lived across the road where Chad Abbott's lives, and that's where they had the first child. And then they moved over to this place, which is where Robo Martin would be. And that's Frank on the horse. And so then when Frank grew up, anyhow, they moved over to the other house. And then after they moved over to the other house, a tornado took that house. So it was gone. But they weren't living in it at the time. And so, so then Frank grows up, gets old enough to to uh, get married, that's where he lives, and that's where the father will have to build a house, and that's where two generations did there. <laughs> yeah, he'd always go to the harbor in the back room and play pitch on Saturday nights with Dad and all the others. And he'd always tell me, boy, you talk too much, boy. You need to be a preacher. <laughs> I guess he was right. <laughs> Formal, formal said you talked enough? No, Frank. Oh. Yeah. But you talk too much, boy. So anyhow, I've shown this in once before, but I'm going to show it again. So this is Guthrie Martin's pocket notebook. And so he has a date at 1883, but it's an 1881 book handed out by Thomas Brothers Lumber and Hardware. Well, how old was Omega in 1881? Four years old? I mean, that town, town was young then, but they're handing out freebie books.
And his writing inside was much neater than mine. Uh, it's all in German, of course. Somebody did interpret it on Facebook and said that one of it was linen, like cloth, and one was liquor. And then he said at the end of the year, that's what the total was on the end, he says it looks like that's about like most farming. He spent $946 to make $927. So. <laughs> and I wanted to put this in kind of on purpose. I ran across that, the back of it, Lester when he was leaving for the Army in 1943. Well, he was born in 1900. He left for World War II when he was 43 years old. That's kind of an old man for war. And most of us in here remember Lester. He was always so quiet and fix anything. Have I ever told you the story about Lester getting his gas stolen? So he was kind of a mechanic there to lose. And his gasoline kept disappearing. So both tanks were empty once, so, so he had him put diesel in the gas tank and then gas in the diesel tank. And then a couple of weeks later, somebody in town there comes up to him and his car is a smoking and a sputtering, wanting to know if he can fix it for him. <laughs> And uh, Roy Burgess's granddaughter Carol sent me this picture of Roy and his draft horses. And he would have been, you know, one of the few survivors of the tornado that took the rest of the family. And that's what his, his other granddaughter emailed me, and I've included that on here just to kind of preserve it. But, you know, she has all the articles on the tornado and lots of family stuff on that. And there's kind of a valuable asset that might go away pretty soon if we don't figure out how to learn that. And then this game, this is submitted by Bob about 1916, the clay farm. Is that a Model A, Bob? You know? I don't know what it is, no? but yeah, that was my father's older three oldest children in the family. They had eight children in that house. It's a four-room house. And it was and then his mother moved in with him, so there was a lot of people. And she was taking care of her father and brother mm. that lived over the hill. Mm. So they were taking care of a lot of people. Yeah. So was that where your uncle lived, Bob? Was that is that where your uncle no. lived? No. That's where I that my house. So the old house that is still there but it's up on the hill. Oh, okay. We moved in when we built a new house. Somewhere, where, where? What's that? Where is it? It's north of town a little way. My calendar's up there on the highway. North of yeah. J.C. Slagle's place, but on the east side of the road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess I should put that on these slides. So I had to stick this one in because Grandma said when we built that garage, it was for the first motorized vehicle they had, which was a Model A. And as narrow as it is and short, I believe it. But she said her dad could never get the hang of keeping a gas engine running. And she said it was her job to keep all the coils and everything firing on that Model A and keep it running. <laughs> then she said when they'd go visiting somewhere, if they stayed too long and the radiator froze up too how much, then one of the guys had to stand in front and pee on the radiator to get a screen fire out so they could go home. <laughs> and so that, and this is the other farm photo that Bob sent, so 1930s. There's horses in the middle of the garden right there. Mm -hmm. You see the plow out there taking mm -hmm. care of they had potatoes on one side, and the next year they would move the potatoes to the other side. Ah. They would rotate them every time. Yeah, that's a pretty big yard. Yeah. And this is an art collection, and it's a Christian Abbott's place, which is where Bruce Abbott's was. But, and that would have been relatives. But what's striking to me is the house is still two story at that time. And so, you know, Chet took off the top story and made it a one-story house later on. It's one story now. So 
So I remember riding the school bus, and there was a two-story house, and then riding the school bus, and there was a one-story house. And this is what it says on the back of this photo. Grandpa and Grandma Abbott's and Bill Abbott's. But that don't look like the Christian Abbott's house. That was kind of a big square thing. I think that's Herb Abbott's house. That's, I think that's what Bill Abbott's built to a mile more than my house. And then I go by their comparison. Anybody else got a better idea? I know that's where Bruce lives. That shed's still standing. So when they first came over, the, the Abbott says she was disabled. Uh, they lived across the road from where Curtis Hefner lives. When you go around that curve a little bit on Bunker Hill Road, right up at the top, and then in a little bit, there's a ruins of the red cellar there and you can see where that cabin was. They were they were dirt poor when they landed here. Really bad. And then Larry, you're in here, so you can take over now. <laughs> that was a long time ago. I'm on the front rows, that one from the left. And Carol Loss is <coughs> sitting on the end. Oh. <clears throat> and behind is uh, Eugene Bossy, a man, <clears throat> and uh, Jean Ann Falk, and my sister, and the tall guy on the end is Woody Robbins. Really? Woody Robbins <laughs> yep. was up around here? Yep, his, his mother was a teacher. Ah. And she would beat on him regularly. <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> she she met all the time. <laughs> was your corn letter that this year? That was last year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, most everybody here probably knows about having the side boards and your swinging ears. Oh, yeah. That's where basketball back to Kansas came from. <laughs> Great Road, our little agreement. Dad always said, the section of the road along your house, you were responsible for doing the grade and maintaining it on your property. And so, yes, ma'am. Can you back up one slide? I, I'd like to take a picture of that because it reminds me of the one that we got in the museum. Right. I don't know where Larry goes. <laughs> I can still remember the team of horses that was standing in purple. Yeah. That's not Lester on that. It's it's no, on the other one. My dad. <coughs> That's not Lester on that program. All I know is what Larry still <laughs> <laughs> Well, they called him Uncle Roper, didn't they? Yeah, he ran it for the council later. I can remember the number of them. Yeah. Lester Chesky? Yeah. yeah. Any other? Yeah, Dad said he, they, they were responsible along there for taking care of one of the properties. So, like, they'd bring them out a tractor, tire takeoff, rock crusher, and you'd drive up to a limestone ledge and throw rocks in there and, and haul them down, put them on the road. That seemed like a lot of work for a fat guy like me.
Okay, now it's Debbie's turn. You in here, Debbie? Come oh, there you are. Anything to contribute? Other than they're just shucking corn, that's part of the uh, responsibilities of the kids. My grandpa, my grandpa is on the far left of the hat on. And then the next 25 year old is from his Rosalie Tunison, and then Aunt Mary, and then Aunt Faye, and then Evelyn Tunison, and way back in the back is Uncle Dean, Dean and Bert. Good. And this comes from my husband's, Dale would be my husband's father, and then his uncle Calvin, out on the farm where we live now. Notice how few trees there are. Yeah. yeah. So that's the same binder, I think, that we've been looking at. And uh, that's a 9 and 4 I think, isn't it? Yeah. And that would be at the Otto Irving Camps. Okay. Place. That makes sense. They've always been four people. Mm -hmm. This is a neat picture. We, I didn't, at least I didn't find any of us back in hay. We still got the stay, hay stacker stored away there, but I wasn't even know how to put it together. So these are neat for me. So Otto, Sons, Joe's on the tractor, Paul's running the team, and Jerry's raking. So they got that four tractor on the sweeps to go around and gather the winter and bring it up to the stacker. Which makes sense. That would be what would wear the horses in. So what was in that back picture, middle picture, what's the guy doing? Is he curling corn? So it's just plenty of corn. Is he planting? Yeah, probably with a lister. That's a good picture of a sweep to pick up hay. What well, actually picked the sweep up when it was full? The guy leaned back and it was balanced like that. Okay. Somehow. Steep learning curve. There's got to be a couple of wheels back in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Surely. <laughs> Grandpa Kufal did that with his horse too. Mm -hmm. 
he hit something at some point in time and the horse flipped over the front and broke his neck. <laughs> Oh, 
You know, you see all those men working, and you know, the women know that somewhere back at the house, there's a lot of work going on back there too, because they had to feed all those guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was a prideful thing as to what they fed them and how well they fed them. And the young kids are out there on their horse bringing in cold water to yep. them. My granddad was the father of Viola Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, August was Strobos. And yeah. his wife was a rush, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. You know, what, what I'm puzzled about is when I look over at the stack, I don't recognize what they're doing there at the stack. I mean, they got a steam engine running it, but there ain't no thrash machine there. Mm -hmm. I Maybe they're just they're stacking it strong. Maybe, maybe there is a threshing machine in there, and it's just the way the photo was taken. I think it's just the way the photo was taken. That should be your load chute there that you see sticking out. Well, I'm not really <coughs> with you. It just looks strange looking at it. So. Well, I'll tell them there were more stacks in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says it's a horsepower buzz saw. I, I guess that could be a PTO shaft down along the ground there. What? Wow. Now, the Eli Purcell, would that have been where Dale Rush lives now? Because I know Elsie lived there, and she had mentioned one time she saw covered wagons going west past their place. So that was where Elsie <coughs> Lewis grew up, was mm -hmm. where Dale Rush lives now. I see. So I'm assuming that was where he or that was. Which direction Reverend? Dale, and where, where Lynn lives now. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Dale's been gone before. <laughs> that's, where, that's where Lynn grew up, so that's where Alice and Dale lived. We're just having fun with you. <laughs> yeah, that's no way ahead. That might be. Yeah. Well, there's a new tail out there behind it. Huh? And that new tail out there behind it, back behind it, there's a church in the center. On the left side of the stack. I see what you're saying. Building on the corner, one far the door. I've never really looked at the backdrop. I was looking at that hay sweet stuff. Dad said he'd hit a rock with them wooden ones and they just snapped and cut. Then that, that mower on the left side, that's, you know, mowing the hay. He says you get up there. You get up to the wire grass, you'd have to get the horses up into a trot to get through the wire grass. <laughs> there is some neat photos in here. Oh, yeah, that's 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 At least they did a heck of a job. That's not our testes. That's probably the auto testes south of the highway. But, there you go, that's not a steam engine, that's a kerosene. What is the age cross? I don't know. Okay. You, you said that to me. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought of Holy Cross, uh, and I thought of a ranch. I, I don't know. But I don't know. Anyhow, in the next picture, I'm looking at that. I think I'm sure this is the same outfit. So that, I've seen that tractor in museums. I just can't think of the name of it right now. But those are neat to me. <laughs> How innovative they got through those years. And that's another kerosene barrel. 
the big challenge all the time was cooling them enough so they had the unique radiators. The Romney oil poles was probably the most popular one. So this was kind of a busy photo. Lisa, you talk about it.
And we think that's probably how I learned that in the car. Yeah. Uh, that's a muscle No. I know. She was older than Melvin. No. Yeah, she's a lot older than Melvin. No. I can say I'm working with Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> so, all that aside, whatever that horse, wheels, and axle were, you can see it going down and under the box and then back up the other side. That survived till my youth. <laughs> I would get down on that hill south of Grandma's and I'd get to riding that down the hill. <laughs> you could get it going airborne over the terrace. <laughs> and I look back at that, if I just stuck my finger out too far, I'd rip the finger off, you know what you were. Oh shit. But, you know, what, what would be best? I mean, 
those times were special for me. When I think back to those times, it was special. And we did everything together. And now I'm the only one on the farm. Everybody else helps out wherever they can, but I'm really the only one there. And it's damn lonely. And it's like, you know, is this the best way now? I don't know. You know, but but then I think back and it's like, well, if we didn't have the modern antibiotics we do now, I wouldn't have Zach around. I wouldn't be around anymore. And I really do like indoor plumbing, so, you know. <laughs> Where, where's that magic level at? I, mean, I don't shed, know that. That little shed is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I, I mean, right now, literally, two months ago, Ponderosa Dairy applied to the Kansas Department of Health and Environment for a waste permit for 107,000 cow animal unit dairy. 107,000 cow. That's, we only have 175,000 in the state right now. That's one dairy in one location. So, what's, what's the future of farming? What's the future of family farming? Mm -hmm. I know that as farmers disappear and our rural landscape becomes unpopulated more and more, it's hard on the rural communities. We all remember when Wheaton had Two grocery stores and uh, thriving businesses on Main Street. And, I mean, mm -hmm. modern agriculture is killing rural communities. That and the automobile, where you can go 60 miles in, in an hour and, and buy it for 10 cents cheaper. But it's all your fault for going to the big brown bag. Yeah. That's where it started, right there. Big brown bag. Big brown bag. Could be. That was the first move. Yeah. It allowed old guys to keep farming that couldn't have farmed before. They would have had to get out of the way for the next generation. That's a very good point. In fact, that's why Gomir invented the round baler. Yep. He, he, was, he was going to church with an elderly guy that says he was going to have to sell the cowherd because he couldn't handle the bells anymore. Mm -hmm. He started thinking about what he could do and that's what developed the round baler. I've maintained that for a lot of years. Yeah. That was the downfall of family farm. Could be. There's, there's, there's probably a lot of reasons, but yeah. I, I think if, if I had my ideal, it would be the 40-20 era. Maybe because I was young and eager then, and that was a hell of a tractor for its time. And, you know, what I noticed when, when I started traveling the road doing financial analysis with farmers is you know, about all the farms were three or four hundred acres, maybe some up to six or seven hundred acres. And then I'd go out to a farm and you'd be farming two thousand acres all by himself. And it's like, how the hell do you do that? Still he says, I'm no telling everything and I'm spraying it. And he says, I can plant a hundred acres in the morning and I can spray a hundred acres in the afternoon and I can do it all by myself. And so, you know, I think Roundup has a lot to do with all at once, one person can farm three or four or five times more than what they did before. And so now farms are getting to the level where you can't even go out and look at everything, so you've got to hire people to go out and look at your crops to tell you what it needs. And it's like, that isn't farming anymore, you know? I mean, the things our parents taught us and which has been come down through the hundreds of years. So I didn't mean to put this on a soapbox. I was just going to say I miss the time with the card table and the lunches in the field. This is the outhouse from Ben Teske's farmstead. I'm sorry? The, the outhouse is from Ben, ben Teske's. No, it isn't. Well, I know it's not at Ben's anymore, but it came from Ben's. How do you know that? Well, that's what you told me a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I sat in that thing my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, okay, I thought it was. <laughs> I thought somebody said You're it. probably right.
Well, that says that Murray, at dawn's hour, will Murray handle them. The calendar over in the outhouse says that they didn't have <laughs> Who did? The calendar is inside the outhouse. Oh, you mean the toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> That's the last.
So I want to thank Don. Um, it's always a delight to see how he puts things together and pulls together the history. Um, so let's give him a round of applause. Don has put together a book of a lot of his writings that he's done through the Herald and different places, and he does have some of those here tonight um, for sale if you're interested in that. Uh, we are going to have a drawing. I have two names in it. It's not really fancy stuff, but if you, don't, if you want your name in the drawing, there's a little piece of paper out there. Put it in there, and while you're getting your refreshments, um, we'll draw after that time. I think tonight, as we look at things, uh, how many of you wish there had been some better documentation on things? Lisa and I struggle with this all the time in the museum. We have just a part of the story. And we don't have the date. We don't have the place. We don't have the name. Uh, how the machine worked. And as we move, as we in, move things into this new building, we hope to do a little bit better of documentation. Now, those of you that work with me know I can't document machines. So those of you that know, have, know the story of these kinds of equipment will need to volunteer to come and help write the story because there is a story to all of these. And the little snippet on the back of the photo just doesn't tell it, does it, Lisa? Uh, and lots of times the little snippet on the back of the photo, we just have to take that as the right information and as we discovered things, it's not always the right information. Um, so then you get in a dilemma. Do you correct the person that brought you the information? Especially if they're no longer alive? Or do you? <laughs> uh, we have one article in the museum. We have one interpretation on one side and the other interpretation on the other side. Because both claim to be equally valid. Uh, so that's just what we did. <laughs> Uh, if any of you would like to see the ag part of our museum, we'll go ahead and open that, open that up. Uh, otherwise, you can come back another day and see that. Uh, I think that's um, all I have to share with you. We have refreshments. If you give us a little bit of time to get those set up and uh, enjoy some lemonade and some cookies from some of our volunteers. Um, and take some time to visit with each other and visit more with Don. And thank you, uh, Rita. I noticed the books on the floor, are they to be taken? I mean, the books are actually. Oh! <laughs> <laughs>